everybody. Hi, there's the red button. We're live. We're live on Jane Unchained. Everyone, I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Welcome to another episode of Awesome Vegans. And I have an awesome vegan right here, veteran newscaster Mark Thompson. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Listen this to that voice. This is a big uh, Jane Unchained day. Yeah, it is. I, because <laughs> the lovely Jane Bellis Mitchell was on my podcast for uh, airing at a future date. And we just finished about an hour together. So this is kind of cool to have a continuation now. Uh, it's two for Tuesday, if you've not noticed. That's what we're doing here. <laughs> two for Tuesday. Uh, I, before we start, if you don't mind. Yes. Because you're so fabulous. Would you mind if I listed off all of your accomplishments? Please, please. <laughs> yeah. So this just to I'll make be leaving you... <laughs> the room for a few minutes because it takes a while. Just so that you can feel good. Okay, so Mark... And, and we were supposed to have a little bit more time before meeting today, so if I've got any of this wrong, you just tell me. Sure. So, Mark, you have been a newscaster, I want to say, starting on Channel but, 11. That's true. For at least... Yeah, let's not. We're going to get a no. long time. Okay, we won't, <laughs> we won't name it specifically. Yeah. Fair enough. But you continue to be... A, so that was with Fox Channel 11 here, News in, in Los Angeles. But right. you continue to be a contributor for the Young Turks Network, which I love. Yep. And also you're a contributor right here on iHeartRadio, which is where we are recording today. Uh, KFI, right. 6.40 a.m. I think tonight you're even filling in for Tim Conway. Yeah, was, right? uh, uh, I'm on with Tim every Tuesday. I, I filled in for him last right. night. And... and, and a KFI is a great platform, and just as it relates to animal issues, I try to sneak in references that everybody knows I'm vegan, of course, because they give me such a hard time about it, or they ask questions about it, and actually Aaron Bender, who's on the show, he is now vegan. So, uh, it's uh, and it's the most listened to talk station in the country, so uh, I view it as an important platform to kind of get, sneak in, as I say, uh, references to animal rights issues and also to uh, even a fun way like um, like they'll be ordering they'll have a big order uh, delivered there of food and I uh, will say go ahead enjoy your torture or whatever the I mean you know you'll re I try to do it playfully but because I think it's important that you remind them yeah. even in a playful way not to be obnoxious I mean again you don't want to be that guy but I do want to try to sneak it in so people remember what they're eating, you know, what they're participating in. Yes, you're helping people to make the connection, right. of course. Uh, well, that's wonderful. Did Were you significant in having Aaron go vegan, or did he come to it on his own? I, I wish I could take credit. Oh. I think uh, uh, Bender was, um, was vegan prior, oh. uh, some years ago, or at least vegetarian, okay. and then and now he's trying it again. So we'll see. Okay, and I always find the switch super easy. Tell me, when and why did you go vegan? Well, I mean, I'm one of those cases where I, um, I was actually telling Jane about this, you know, I was, um, I was always envious of people who could do it. Imagine yeah. that. I mean, I kept saying, oh, I, I want to do it. I, I know it's bad, but I just can't do it. I'm, I'm, I, someday I'm going to be a vegetarian is what I said. And, um, I was on television getting dogs adopted and cats adopted. I was very active in the, uh, animal adoption community. Mm -hmm. And then I was, and this is something else Jane and I talked about, you have to be ready. You know, like I was already yes. talking about it, and a few friends of mine said, you know, you were really, we could tell you were ready to go. Mm. So uh, I'm trying to think. I was Sam Simon, who was a dear friend. Sam Simon, um, who was creator of The Simpsons, and he's just a brilliantly funny, magnificent guy. Uh, he is an animal activist, or was an animal activist, passed away, but he was a brilliant animal activist. I mean, yeah. he may have uh, single-handedly funded some of the biggest animal rights organizations in the world, like Sea Shepherd, Mercy for Animals. PETA has a yeah. building named after Sam, so you get a sense for this. Um, and uh, I should mention, not just animals, he's the biggest single contributor to Save the Children mm. in the history of the organization. Mm. So. Sam Simon was a brilliant philanthropist and, as I say, a creative mind, creator of The Simpsons. He became a friend, and I was waiting to do his radio show. Uh, he had, like, an Internet radio show. And they were talking about some of the things that uh, are involved with animals and their treatment in the animal agriculture world. Mm. And I started to ask some additional questions, and once it was all laid bare for me... Bam. I just went vegan. I want nothing. I had somebody come over and take all the uh, meat 
out of the freezer and take every we took we got rid of anything that had was an animal product uh, immediately. Like I didn't want to go. Well, as soon as I finish this stuff, yeah. I'll change. No, 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 no. I don't want any part of this ever again. And so when people ask me, "Are you still vegan?" I go, "Are you kidding me? That's that will never change. I don't miss." anything. I associate it all with some of the most horrifying things that man has wrought on other creatures. Yes. And on the planet, and on our health, and on our wallet. I could go on and on. Uh, so for you, it was like a one day to the next, a, an immediate switch. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I mean, years? to be really, I'm trying to think of, it was might have been a week, but I don't think it was but even a week. Relatively immediate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a long time now, right? How long it's has been, it been? I don't know. If that, you know, a long time. When I run into some of these people, you know, who are on this network or yeah. uh, wherever they've been um, for a long time, I mean, a real long time. Mine's been six and a half years. Oh, good. So, so good that's a time. while, but that's not nearly as long as others. And I so wish I'd done it sooner. Yes. I mean, right. anybody watching or anybody who knows anyone who's young and can make this change early in your life, it will be the best thing you ever did Quality for your body. Quality of life will be completely and, different. And for, yeah. So I, I really wish that I had done it 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah, I feel the same. And when I talk to vegans, usually they always say, oh, I wish I had done it earlier. Yeah. For me, just a, some of you have maybe heard me say this before, I never wanted to eat meat as a child. I knew I didn't want to chew it. Wow. I knew that something was wrong. It made me sick to my stomach, and I was severely punished for not eating meat. And I was forced to stay at the table, sometimes five hours by myself, alone, because I wasn't allowed to leave the table until I finished my meat. So I started hiding the meat, and then of course I got caught. So then I got in trouble for lying about it. So my whole life, I grew up in Chicago, I thought I had to. I, I really felt sort of, and my poor parents, they didn't know. They're trying sure. to do their best. They don't know. I sort of felt bullied into it. You know, as I grew up and I went out into society, I thought I have no choice here. I just have to do it. My nephew is an athlete. He went to the University of Oregon, and the coach there said, I don't want you eating meat or dairy. And I was like, you mean someone gave you permission to not eat meat or dairy? <laughs> oh, I'm vegan. I was vegan like that sentence. I was like, oh, my God. Someone's telling you I'm vegan. I'm vegan. I've got permission. I'm doing it, which is strange that I would need permission, but I've just been so tortured. Not tortured. My parents love me. I was just, No, they, you know, they, as you say, they didn't know better. No, they and didn't know none better. of us knew better uh, many years ago right uh, once you know I think it's it's hard and that's why this entire network the Jane Unchained network and also your work and, and all the different ways that uh, your work gets out there and all of us who try to get the word out in any way that we can that's why it makes a difference because it sheds light once you do know it's harder to turn a blind eye to it yes I think there's a great quote from Oprah Winfrey once you know you can't pretend you don't know you know. So I think when we all kind of string together the facts, and as we were talking about before, make the connection for people, uh, it's hard to pretend you don't know once you know. So sort of taking that a step further, you are obviously a veteran journalist, and you started your career, if I've got this right, really in environmental journalism. Right. I did, uh, I did, I've always done weather. I've kind of had a, this weather thing. They had me do weather and environmental science reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, that was probably at the uh, the broadest uh, scope of my career as a journalist, I was able to really do some things that were um, that were challenging. You know, the thing with so many environmental science stories is you have to explain the situation, the scientific uh, study, perhaps or discovery, oftentimes, and then you you have to then turn it into a story. So mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the environment, you have to set the stage, what's going on now, this is what's happening, and you have to do it in a minute and a half when it's on television. So it, it, it presents some challenges, but th those were some of the, the most fun challenges that I, I experienced. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, because we've had an environmental nightmare, and as we have more and more climate change, this becomes more and more frequent. So obviously we had Hurricane Florence, which is an environmental nightmare, and I find that there's lots of online writing about the environmental situation, and of course, how many animals. To date, it's 4.1 million birds and 5,500 pigs, although that number is going to rise because those who were fortunate enough to not drown intentionally in their factories, they don't have access to food because the roads are still flooded and they can't get foods into these processing farms. So a lot more animals are yet to die. So there, 
there hasn't been any coverage of the animals, what's happening to the animals online or specifically on TV where there's been almost no coverage at all. And I wondered if you could give your perspective as a veteran journalist, specifically in the environmental world, why isn't mainstream media covering this? Uh, the answer on so many things is if it doesn't make sense, it's about money. And I think it is about money. I think big agribusiness drives so much of the commercial support of newscasts around the country. And as a result, you don't see a lot of things critical of agribusiness. Uh, they talk about the loss for the farmers, quote, farmers. They're huge industrial farmers, of course. Yes, they're businesses. Uh, yeah, but they're yeah. businesses, exactly. Mm -hmm. And because yeah. they're businesses, because they're such robust, big agribusinesses, they really, in essence, buy the silence of the media and journalists. So you hear again of the loss of the, that these farmers have suffered. And they, they'll say, they'll call it livestock. You know, they lost X uh, in livestock. But uh, you don't hear about it as, uh, you know, Jane said a great thing. I hate, I hate to quote Jane all the time. She's so smart. And Let's the way quote she, Jane. The way she says certain things. And one, one of the things she said was, if I told you I'm leaving warehouses, sheds, industrial farms full of dogs to oh, go drown, yeah. you would never, it would never happen. They would chopper in people to rescue those dogs. But when you leave pigs and cattle behind, chickens, um, we don't hear about it at all, as you've just noted. I'm it's 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 shameful, it's reprehensible, it's obscene, and it's money. That's the reason you don't. But, but, but here's a story as well. Even if you don't want to cover it from the animal perspective, which there's something seriously wrong if you can't see that perspective, there's a business perspective. So we had Hurricane Matthew in 2016. The same thing basically on a smaller scale happened. We haven't changed any of our practices. What insurance company would sign up to insure, and I'll just tell you the, from the animal perspective, what that means is they're letting all those animals die, they're paying to restock them as if they were furniture widgets, and we're going to do this all over again in a floodplain. So that's a story, even if you don't want to take the animal perspective. You're what, right. That's a great story, and, that, that, that there, are no, uh, there are no changes being made to the way this land is being used, to the way this land is being protected, to the way the the coast is responding to these bigger and bigger hurricane events. I think that's a very fair point. And why would the insurance company say, sure, I will insure you again, even though you've done nothing to change? That's a dumb business right there. So there's a lot beyond the obvious humane. And, the and you know, I'm all about hugging a tree and crying for the animals. Believe me, that's what I'm all about. But if you don't want to take that perspective, there's a gazillion other good business reasons, good health reasons, good environmental reasons. Oh, and if you care about your children and you hope that they have a future, there's a good reason for that as well, that you don't want to have industrial farming like we have it. But there are many ways to cover this story. They don't cover it on any any plane. So let me... Yeah, you're right. That's a, I, I, I'm, I'm listening going, wow, that's really true. I mean, I think, you're, I think you're right to make the point, and it's not a point that I've heard made appropriately. As you say, it, this story has other angles by which it can be told. Yeah. That's right. So, so let me ask you a little bit more direct question. Do you think it really comes down as a directive, you shall not cover animal rights? And that goes from the general manager to the news director to the news reporter. Is it that direct? Um, I think it... I, I, no, I don't think it comes down directly. I think it's... I think it's handled... It depends. You know, I've worked in big newsrooms where there are different layers of people. So when I... I you know, in smaller communities, maybe North Carolina... Uh, it's still a big market, North Carolina, but, mm -hmm. but there may not be the layers as you might find as Los Angeles and New York or Chicago. Uh, it may be a news director who goes, no, I want to concentrate on the farmers. There are viewers. I there see. are people. People are uh, concerned with the farming community. They work in the farming communities. I want to hear about the workers, how they've been displaced. I, I want to hear about the farmers and how they... I think that's the way the message is. It's not, don't cover the animals. It's, I, I want to hear about the farmers. And so... If I were to be the reporter out there and I were to do did something like, and the loss of animal life here is uh, un unspeakably great, um, they would go, you know, I understand that that is one of the, I don't think we need to talk about, 
uh, animal loss of life when so many people have lost their lives and their livelihoods. My point is, that's the way they would rejigger it. I yeah, I, I suspect that's the way it goes down. I see. Although I will say, and I understand that perhaps this is not the perspective in North Carolina, but around the rest of the country, people who have seen those numbers, because I've been asking people, granted, this is just my, you know, sidekick survey, I've been asking meat eaters, what do you think about the pictures that you're seeing? What do you think about the, the flood all the way to the top of the building and you know that there are animals in there and you know that they're just throwing them out and restocking them? They're all horrified, which is a nice way for me to enter into the conversation and sort of make the connection and say, well, then don't fund that activity. Vote with your wallet if that's how you feel. But I, I'm not trying to lecture them in that particular moment. I'm trying to get them to make the connection and most people, when they see those photos, I don't know if you've had this experience, they're not for the farmers. They feel that it's an enormous waste. Yeah, I, I, I haven't had that situation where I've confronted people with mm. pictures or even had that conversation. I applaud you for having it. Um, I, uh, I, 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 you can't look at those pictures and feel good about things. You can't look at any of the things that are happening uh, in the wake of...